Where do you go as a speaker if you want to earn the big bucks? How is selling from the stage any different to keynote speaking? This episode is for the speaker who wants to earn the biggest paychecks in speaking, and also for those of you who have courses, books, and programs, but don't know how to sell things from the platform. My guest for this episode is someone who's generated millions in sales from the stage and has mastered his craft so well that he's one of the very few people out there who is teaching the skill of platform sales. Mitch Carson has been a pitch man on a home shopping network. He's produced over 2,000 live events. He knows how to sell anything and craft a unique message around any product, person, or event. So have you ever tried to make a pitch from the stage and maybe not had it go so well or made many sales? I know I have. Do you lack confidence when it comes to platform sales? Have you ever wondered how important is it really to have a book if you're a professional speaker? Well, Mitch has the answer to all of these questions, so stay tuned. And welcome to Present Influence, the show that helps business leaders develop the skills to influence and inspire. My name's John Ball. I'm a keynote coach, professional speaker, and your guide on the journey to leadership level communication and presentation skills. My mission is to provide rising leaders like you with everything you need to maximize your impact and present with influence. Follow the show on your favorite podcast app for weekly episodes and interviews with influence experts. Well, welcome to this episode, which is primarily about platform sales and the psychology of selling from the stage. It is a skill that is hard to master, undoubtedly, and you may find that this isn't really for everyone, but here's who this episode is really for. If you are thinking that you might at some point want to be able to make sales from the stage, whether that's a real stage in front of a live audience or a virtual stage, if you are thinking of making sales of a course, a product, a service, a book, anything like that, then you will get some great value in this episode. If you're curious about where the big bucks are as a speaker, and maybe even think you might like to venture into the highly competitive red ocean of selling from the stage, this episode is going to be very much for you. I have to say in advance of this, there was a lot of stuff that we didn't get to that may have to see if Mitch will come back again in the future. But what I really wanted to know was what Mitch saw as being the primary difference between keynote speaking and being a professional pitch person from the platform. Now, I don't personally particularly agree with Mitch's assessment of why keynote speakers do keynote speaking. However, he's entitled to his opinion. Still, I think you'll get some great value from the distinctions that he offers. So let's get into it. All right, here. Now, what I'm going to share might offend some people, but that's been my personality my whole life. Okay, keynote speaking is great. Many people aspire to live for applause. I live for wallets opening up. Therein lies the distinction. My measurement is not the positive reviews I get. It's the amount of money I made per head. So therein lies an, another distinction. I couldn't give a wallop about getting a positive review from Becky, Joan, Jim, or John. I don't care as long as they invest. Because the job of a platform pitch person is to convert dollars, pounds, or euros per head and or buying unit if it's a man or a woman in an audience. My metrics are very different than that of someone who's out there key keynoting. They may look at their measurement as, oh, I saw some people bought my books at the back of the room. Whoopie-doo, how many people bought your 10K program after speaking for 90 minutes? That's, right. that's the value that, you know, people like Russell Brunson, who sold $3.8 million at Grant Cardone's event. That is impressive. Yeah. Mitch Carson who sold 800,000 from a stage in, in Tokyo eight years ago. That's impressive. Or 1.6 million that I sold in an audience of 500 back in 2006. Those are big numbers. And I've also fallen on my sword where I blanked. We were talking about T Harv just a minute before we mm, began. We will. He was speaking at an event at LAX. This is going back. Oh gosh, this is the the late nineties in Los Angeles. And I I occupied the room after he left. He had a group and he moved everybody into a free seminar. That was his old model. 
And the promoter that I was working with, promoter T Harv, well, he didn't promote me, he forgot to do this. So I show up and there were six people in the audience. Six. T Harv had wow. 200. I came in to sell six. Now, do you think I cared about getting an applause or getting positive reviews? No. And here's the, here's the truth, John. Four of them were my employees. Oh. <laughs> and the other two were drunks that we gathered up from the bar outside in the, in the hotel. Yikes. So, yeah. So it was, but you move on. I mean, that's just the life of the speaker. And the same with any performer, because it is a performance. It's yeah. the... You, the show must go on. I believe that was an expression that came out of the UK back in the days of uh, Shakespearean theater. I, I can well believe that's where it originates from. The show must go on. Like I mentioned, I don't really think that the reason that I get up on the stage is because I want the applause. However, I do understand that applause and audience feedback are some of the metrics that we have as keynote speakers that are very important to us. For someone who is selling from the platform, the only metric that really matters is how much money you're making at the event. I was definitely curious about the kinds of events that Mitch would speak at and what the difference would be between him and perhaps the keynote speakers and other people who are at these events. So let's hear a bit more from Mitch. Let's look at environments. The keynote speaker has his or her place in the speaker arena. I mean, if I can identify very quickly, because it'll take me 60 seconds to synopsize this. There are the people that MC. They don't sell necessarily. There are people that are panelists and there are people that are trainers. Trainers is a whole separate category. So you have keynote speakers. The one person who's on stage is the keynote speaker and or the platform pitch person. The pitch person, in my opinion, because I've done everything in the speaking business, almost four decades now on stage, everything. I've done it all multiple times. Platform pitch people are the highest paid because they'll die if they don't survive. You're there to eat what you kill. Very typically, you're not paid to come. You're not given room and board. And you're there to sell. And the environment you sell to is usually people with the capacity to purchase. So if you are selling at the corporate event of ExxonMobil, let's say for an example, and you've mm -hmm. got a crowd of all, if it's the year-end event, or the sales event, the sales recognition event of all their high level, they usually call it a round table or something of sales professionals that sell a certain amount of oil and gas. And there are a hundred salespeople that are pumped and ready in the audience. They are employees. They may need motivation. They may need a system to help them climb the ladder a little bit more in terms of sales conversions and or recognition. A keynote speaker would be the solution because a platform pitch person such as myself, then I've sold sales trainings multiple times in events. It has to be the one that has the capacity to pull out his or her credit card and buy. Right. So if they're employees, the platform pitchman has no place unless Somebody, because there, a, a, a sale may take place post event, but in an, in an opportunity where it's salespeople, it's usually a best selling author on sales who's written a book, who's invited and gets a fee of 15, 25,000. If it's a New York Times best selling book, then they're probably going to get 25K. If they're right. just an Amazon book, they're lucky if they get 15K. That's the reality. Okay. People think, oh, I want 25,000. Well, what have you done to earn it? Are you a New York Times bestseller? Are you in media all over the world? Do you have a column in Entrepreneur Press or uh, in Forbes? What justifies a promoter to pay you 25,000? Which to me is peanuts money anyway, because if I'm going to go sell and I don't sell 25K worth of product, I've failed. I've okay. failed because usually in that environment, half the revenue is split with the promoter. Mm -hmm. Like we were talking before we began about me meeting Sir Richard Branson at the O2 Arena, which is a large arena. I think it holds 40,000 in London. Sir Richard is a keynote participant. He's not right. really a speaker. He's, he's someone that gets interviewed. So he's there, you know, Lord Sugar was a keynote and pissed off the entire crowd because of his, his way. And then there were other 
And then the rest of us, those are the draws. Those are the reason people come in to see the keynote speakers. The rest of us were there, were sharks. We're there to eat the meat off the people. They may be attracted to the beautiful fish that's flashing, and that's Sir Richard and, and of course, the persnickety uh, sugar guy, yeah. Lord Sugar. He's a lord of some sort. They are the flashy fish. Then the piranhas and or the sharks are people like me that come in and chew it all the way down to the bone. And that's how the seminar promoter makes his money, is the piranhas and the sharks yeah. or barracudas, whatever fish you want that are carnivorous, and we're there to feed the promoter. He's got to make his money back off what he invested with Sir Richard and Lord Sugary, who's not so sugary. I guess he's Lord for Ber Snickety. But that's, that's the yeah. model. Okay. And, um, does that make sense? I, it does. And I love your story. Uh, mm. So I'm curious whether, mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like it's a really highly competitive environment. Extremely, extremely. Uh, now this could easily have been a time to get into my story about having auditioned for The Apprentice with Sir Alan Sugar, because you will never have seen me on that show. You can guess I didn't get through the auditions. It's very interesting. I didn't get to meet Sir Alan Sugar. Not a huge fan of his personally. However, moving on from that, I can well appreciate what he might have been like at, at a live event there. But what was coming up for me whilst Mitch was saying this is like, who's this really for? Are there people who are more cut out for selling from the stage and maybe people who really just aren't cut out for it? I'm assuming that it's probably not for everyone. No. Well, who are the people who are cut out for it? And maybe who's not? Okay. Again, this is just opinion and it isn't always true. This is a gross generalization. I would say the people who are cut out for platform selling are the people who like a challenge. And if you are living in the world of safety and security, pursue keynote speaking. Because you will get a paycheck and it's negotiated by either your uh, speaker bureau, if you're lucky to get hired by one and they'll take their cut and they'll mm. send you here, here, and here. You can make a nice living. And, the, you know, nice living is, of course, relative to whomever. Sure. But most keynote speakers I know who've done well are making two to 300K a year. They have a book, they've been in media, and they have a relevant topic, which they have to update regularly because they want to get invited back. Otherwise, you're just constantly on the treadmill. Yeah. The platform pitchman is for someone who is a risk taker usually a former competitive athlete, someone who loves competition. I was on the pro karate circuit myself in my twenties. So I okay. love the pressure. I love mm. being in a ring opposite the other man and us knocking the crap out of each other and seeing who survives. It's no different. I don't hit anybody anymore. Because that was a sport, but in the world of, of platform pitchmen, let's take Mac Actrum. For example, we talked about Mac yeah. before. Max, a fellow speaker, I respect him a lot. He's also, I'm a six degree black belt. He's a fourth degree black belt in Taekwondo. We talked about that. We met in KL at an event some years back. He would be on the stage competing. We would ask each other, how well did you do? A, to support each other, because that's what good speakers do who played the long game. We're there to support each other. You never know who you can refer or not because he talks about a different topic than me. And, but we're also subtly going on, how well did he do versus me? That's the competitive spirit that comes in us. You know, it's like the knights come back from battle. How many heads did you lop off? You know, it's that competitiveness that exists with the platform pitch person who wants to challenge himself, herself, because it's women too. Women are, are equally sure. talented. I've seen some great women speakers who are both great, great keynotes and are good closers. They like that competition as well. Typically a sports com competition background. If you've ever worked in any kind of professional sales environment, you'll know that they tend to be highly competitive. And so really it can feel very cutthroat because it's always com in competition with each other and people thrive of beating each other and things else. Now, sometimes that's in a very healthy and respectful way. And sometimes it's, it's really not. So professional speaking as a platform pitch person is undoubtedly much more challenging and competitive than keynote speaking. It is very much for those who thrive on competition. 
So what's Mitch's experience of this? Is it generally that the competitiveness in professional speaking, professional platform sales is one of healthy competition? Or is it more cutthroat and maybe more of a situation where you'll find yourself swimming with sharks? It's, in, it's interesting. I mean, it, it, it sounds like even though it's very highly competitive, that it's, it's pretty healthy and respectful competition. Most of the time, yes. Most yeah. of the speakers I've met in my 30 plus years selling from the stage, I would consider most friends. Now, some are some arrogant asses. I don't want to get into their names. We'll talk off, <laughs> off camera about. Okay, you know, but I, I would, but there are people who've earned asshole, who've learned the asshole crown. But I, I'll yeah. keep them nameless. And most are good people or else they're not going to be in the world because it's a very small universe and we talk. As a seminar promoter myself, there are certain speakers I'll never book because friends who are in the events business have told me about someone and we don't want headaches. So it's important to get along with the people. We're all playing in this pond and you have to keep a positive vibe when you take the stage. You can't be distracted by drama, personality, clashes, all of this. You're there to support each other. If I yeah. saw Mac or uh, other speakers that I've shared the stage with that we, we may have talked about, we're there. Hey, how's it going? Tell me something good. It's not, Hey, I've heard your health is bad. We're not there to talk about that. We're here to support each other and to raise our vibration and our positivity because there's no more challenging arena when you've got a, a, an arena full of people and you're there to sell them. You got to motivate them to pull out their credit cards. I, I can really imagine that the heat is on in that kind Big of time. situation. Big and, time. Huge you know, pressure. Probably the only thing I could really compare it to in my, in my experience, I've never really sold from the stage, but it would be maybe try, trying to make people laugh from the stage. And same. Like, can have, yeah, it's the same kind of pressure, right? It's a very intense pressure, very different incomes, unless you really hit the big time, but very much the same kind of pressure. So, so I'm curious, so other than the sort of the hunger for competitiveness and, and things that you mentioned, are there other other traits that you think do make someone a better presenter or a pitch person? Yes, there are other key traits. Number one, willingness to hear and implement feedback. Because if you are a robot who simply just does keynotes, your presentation is typically similar event to event to event. If you, however, and you, but there are some many similarities as well. You know when you connect to an audience or when you don't. If your jokes don't hit, you then yeah. can come up with a new one. So there are many similarities, but the dissimilarities, I would say the uniqueness to the platform pitch person is that individual must understand human psychology, must be very tapped into an audience dynamic, must be tapped into cultural faux pas of being in an environment. And I'll, I'll be happy to share, John, some of my biggest failures, which I've learned well, from. It's good to hear about them, yeah. Yeah, I have made so many mistakes, but I have failed my way to success. And you have it's necessary to overcome and deal with the failures that you're going to learn from. If you don't, it's a tough, if I gave up when I first started selling from the stage and I was awful, awful, huh, I could have very comfortably gone the route of the trainer and or keynote speaker easily. Yeah. I'm comfortable on the stage. I'm told I'm funny. People laugh, do all that. But selling is a completely different level. It's a, it's riskier because there's no security of money. There's no security of your travel in most cases. When I'm running my events, if I have a platform pitchman that I've invited in to sell a crypto course, for example, which was hot, now it's not so hot anymore, but each time the, the ones that are continually hot is how to make money. Yeah. People will buy how to make money. It's either through today it's share trading or, or options or some type of real estate when it's hot, all of these property investing, those are evergreen speakers who may have a unique solution if they show the case studies. Those people are the staples that those of us who are seminar promoters need to place on our stages because they bring in the money. Without them, we're dead because yeah. it's rare to make money before the doors open. You make your money, you invest, you lose, you go in negative, and then 
at the end of the day, you realize, okay, I spent a hundred K to put on this event and I brought in a hundred thousand in revenue, uh, after the split for the speakers, I just broke even because there's one thing return on ad spend. And then there's the overall re return on investment, which includes the room and all the other things. So it's all about the math. You can't gotcha. put your buddies on the stage because you like them. No, who's going to get you out of the negative hole that you're in to produce this thing in the first place. You got to yeah. have platform pitch people. Now you can probably pick up somewhat Mitch's energy, even if you're just on the audio version of this episode, his energy is high. So I was really curious that how important is that energy aspect of being a platform pitch person? It's everything. You've got to believe in your product. So it's passion, knowledge, and a willingness to ask for the money. First, you got to know your, your product that you're selling. You have to understand the framework with what makes people raise their hand and want what you have. You don't teach too much. You just give them the what, not the how. The how comes because of my system. How you implement this, this is what you need because I've identified your pain point and you p deliver it in a passionate way. So make, making you believable. So yes, mm. I am passionate about what I do. And I've been challenged and I know what it can do for other people. That's why I teach, you know, in my speaking mastery, how to get people to convert to buying what you have to sell. And there is a process. This whole topic is super interesting to me, not just from the perspective of being a speaker myself, but really from, I just love the psychology of influence and persuasion. And this is an aspect of it that seems super important. This is where you're really going to see a lot of the influence principles in action at these kind of live events. And if you are going to be this kind of speaker, you need to be able to implement them effortlessly and naturally in a way that's going to seem completely normal. But how do you get started with this? Do you have to have your own product or service to become a professional pitch person or could you be selling someone else's? I've done both, John. That's a great question. I semi, -re I retired, then I what my, I put myself in the position of semi-retirement living in Bali. There was an Australian gentleman who I got connected with by who needed, he had a great software solution for SEO and it was a hack using Google Hangouts some years ago. And I was living in Bali, flip-flops, t-shirt and shorts, getting bitten by mosquitoes daily, but I loved it living on a motorbike. And I got approached by this fellow named Peter Drew. Good fella, good bloke, as they say in the, in, in Australia. Yeah. And he had a great product. I then struck a deal with him to be his pitchman, making a percentage of what I sold. So I, I got booked on all these webinars. He was a software developer, but not a pitch person. I think he later went on for subsequent, uh, releases that he had and pitched his own products. But I sold this pr program called hangout millionaire some years ago while sitting in a small air conditioned box in a co-op workspace yeah. in, in Ubud, Bali, which is the jungle area where there are monkeys running around on the street. And it was a great experience, but I had never sold someone else's product. I'd always sold my own, but I had sold off my company in America, retired, moved to, to Asia. And I got connected to this guy through another friend who was living in, in Chiang Mai, Thailand and said, oh, you got to talk to Mitch Carson. He's a pitch person, the classic sense of one. So I got introduced to him. The very first event, I think there were about, I don't remember, I think 600 people on the webinar. I did it on the webinar. I hadn't sold on webinars before. I'm used to a live audience. The process is the same. It's just a weird dynamic when you're talking into a camera yeah. and you don't know, there's 600 people. And I sold 38% of the uh, attendees. That's a very good number in the yeah. webinar world. If you sell 10%, you're considered good. On that particular day, my first time out of the box, was it beginner's luck? No, it was 30 years of training to get to that point to where I transferred my skills from a live in-person audience to a live virtual audience. And I was able to sell them into this $1,000 solution. They'd never heard of me. 
I wasn't known in the software industry at all. These are people that were geeks behind, that was their self-anointed title. They're geeks that sat behind a computer, not social people. These yeah. are SEO freaks. And they didn't know me from Adam. But I came in and just marched and I had no idea whether I was going to be fired or invited back. Well, I did get invited back and that relationship lasted about a year and a half until the software become, became antiquated or we flooded the market and it was no longer. But out of the box, I had a 38% conversion rate and I'd have to go back to the money. It was very good money. I got a nice check. We sold very well. Next thing I know, my PayPal is ding. Nice amount of money. He was happy. I was happy. And I realized I'm no longer retired. I guess I'm semi-retired because a week later I did it again. And then I did it again, you know, two weeks later or something else. All selling for 90 minutes. Presenting, mm. creating the opportunity. Here's the, what it will do, how it does it. You got to buy the solution. And I did very well with that. When Mitch and I were speaking before we hit record, we both started to realize we had a lot of very similar connections, a lot of people in common, and we've both been around the industry. Now, it's very possible we'd even connected before in person and just <laughs> didn't remember it. However, this was the time when we really started to get to know each other. What I started to get curious about at this point, though, was whether Mitch was doing more live in-person events or whether the industry as a platform pitch person was more virtual events these days and also which was his preference i came from the same world you're talking about it was all live in person slowly webinars came in it was go to webinar i had an account with them or or you know people that i worked with and that was the the chosen platform until the pandemic and then everybody went to zoom i haven't heard yeah. the go to webinar name now in probably four years still but around but yeah well you bring this up in two weeks i'm going to be doing three webinars in a row to fill my speaking mastery program in Singapore, how to sell from the stage to a group. I'm doing three webinars in a row. We're testing different formats, different variables on the sales page to see which converts. And I'm going to show all of this to my attendees who are future seminar producers themselves. So I'm mentoring right. them in the process. I'm also doing one preview event live in person to a different group of people. And we will compare the numbers and I will show them, this is how much it costs. I've spent X dollars on ads. Here's how many people showed up on the webinar, how many I converted on the webinar. Here's how many converted in the live preview event. All of that will matter. And I'll show the numbers. And this is what you can expect. I'm a seasoned pro doing this. So it might be different than someone who is brand new at it, but at least they'll have a template to compare to. And I will reveal all my ads, everything to show them what it takes. I prefer the live in-person model because I've done that for so many years. I like to meet people, shake their hands. Yeah. And then I have a, a greater connection. Virtual is fine. We got forced into that because of the pandemic. Subsequently, now a lot of hybrid events. I think today, if you're running a larger workshop, you need to include virtual attendance and, pay, and they must pay for it. Virtual attendance to bring in, because I guess for example, John, I produced the world's first chat GPT live event in Las Vegas almost two years ago. January of coming up of 25 will be two years since I produced that event. I had 300 people capacity crowd in an audience live in person for a one day event in Las Vegas. I also had 263 people who paid $200 to attend virtually. That virtual attendance, which is 263 people times $200, paid for my ad budget. Before I opened the doors, I was positive, cash flow. So when I sold 600 grand that at, to, the, uh, to the attendees that day, I made money. That was a good payday of an upsell to the crowd. Now, here's the difference and I want to share. The in-person people accounted for most of the sales. One person bought an $8,000 package from the virtual attendance. That's a case study. Why? Because when I got around to pitching, you don't know whether they're paying attention or not. Yeah. In the virtual environment, I can go up and physically shake somebody if they're in their phone 
in the live environment, and I do that. I'll say, hey, you paying attention, buddy? Everybody laughs. Listen to what I have to say. This will change your life. I can physically go do that. I have no idea what they're doing when they're on camera. They could be in the restroom. Who knows? They could be cooking yeah. a cup of tea. I don't know. And it's the conversions are higher with live in person. I guess because the people in the ring probably are more focused. Uh, yeah. that, that would make a lot of sense. But also, I mean, the, ener the energy in live events, as you mentioned, is very different. It is very totally different. different. I'm, I'm curious, and this maybe has two parts to it, this question, as to whether whether the events you mostly speak and present at are ones you create yourself or whether there are events that you do that are not stages that you have cr uh, created for yourself. And how do you end up on those stages? All so right. I'm in two parts there. Great. T. Harvecker was, I think he sold his money, his, his business to SR Success Resource some yeah. years ago. Be before, he used to invite outside speakers. I was not one of them. I was running my own events and I was speaking on other platforms. So I think it's a balance of both. When you start out, I would recommend getting on other people's stages and you're basically a parasite. You're piggybacking on the hard work of the promoter to make money. You're also building your list it's all risk and reward based on what you sell. You don't have any say in the layout of the room or you just show up, you pitch and you leave or you pitch and stay and maybe you'll convert more people, which is also a wise tactic. I stick around if I can, unless I have another event to go to. So I've done both in my career. In my early years, while I learned the event business, I was pure parasite, pure parasite, leech, leeching off someone else's of it. it may sound like a crude metaphor, but it's a realistic one. You are there to support and or, but you're grabbing onto, you're leeching on to their effort, their crowd, you're benefiting and they're benefiting. And that's the way to go. And then you learn the overall scope of the events business. John, I'd be curious to hear what your take is on that. You know, you, you have to crawl before you walk and you learn the crawling techniques before you go and embark, there's so many things to know to create your own events. It's scary. It's financially uh, a scary, you know, it's it's not an upward slope necessarily. Most fail. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. a scary investment because you better know your shit. I think this probably isn't going to be the first time in this episode that I'm going to stand up comedy in terms of when you're getting started in stand up. You're going to do open mic nights. You're going to Correct. do, you're going to get on, you're going to get on stages where no one knows you. You're going to maybe even have your joke cards in your hand because you need to test your material and make sure that it works. It's the lowest risk way of doing it. So it sounds to me that the lowest risk way of getting into becoming a pitch person professionally is to get on other people's stages, create relationships with promoters and get yourself into some of those events before you have the even bigger risk of getting onto your own live stages where there's much bigger costs and ads associated. Maybe less, maybe it's a bit easier now with the online events to do that because yes. probably you've only really got the ad risk in that of like, you might not get full return on your ad investment, but even so, yeah, other people's stages where they're, even where they're doing the advertising, that has to be a, a much lower risk way to ease yourself into the industry. 100%. And it's a great way to start because you'll learn the ins and outs of the business. You'll learn what it takes in order to attract speakers because it's all about networking. In my career, I've never had to market myself as a speaker. It has always been referrals from somebody seeing me in the crowd or a fellow speaker who promotes her own events and says, Mitch, I'd like you to come and speak at my event. And then I speak there and then it's, oh, I've got an event coming up to my group of people, my audience of people, you're terrific. You're funny. You're nice. Come speak at my event. And it went like that for years, John. I didn't create my own events right away. For more than a decade, I was a leech speaking on other stages because I also had an ad agency that I owned in LA and that was my core job. Speaking was a way of me bringing in clients right. and it worked and it was a good model. I wasn't full time as a speaker. It grew into that over time. I was once a month, then it became more like twice a month. And then sometimes I would speak two or three times over a weekend in the same city, speaking in the morning here, afternoon there, traveling over to another side of the city, speaking at somebody else's event, 
on Sunday morning, hopping on a plane and going home Monday night or Sunday night. That happened. That started to happen. And then it became very lucrative. And I, I started to look thinking, my gosh, why am I fighting employees and doing all those? I'm making all kinds of money as a speaker and I'm busting my hump at running an ad agency with complaining, whining employees. And that, that's a babysitter job. We're here. I come in, I'm celebrated. I get people that want to take pictures with me. I am, you know, the, the celebrity speaker. And all I have to do is come and speak for 90 minutes, make good money, very good money. I covered my own expenses. This was the life. Yeah. But then something happened. The crash happened in 2006. Right. Everything shut down. So when the times are good, they're really good. But when they're bad, the, the peril of running a business like that is if you don't have money while you sleep income, as in courses that are online, which is a smarter way to go, you run the, the risk of sinking very quickly when times change and they will change unexpectedly. Yeah. The only yeah. thing that's guaranteed is there is change. I, I certainly remember the industry thinned a lot around the 2006, 2009 oh, yeah. sort of period. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm interested. I mean, based on your journey, do you, would you say it's the, that a better way to approach this for people who are looking to get into this area would be to transition from what they're doing? Or do you think you can set yourself up to be able to just take the leap and fly straight away? Oh, I've seen people do both. Hindsight, looking back over my career, I mean, I'm probably in the sunset phase coming up here at some point. Now I just teach others. For the most part, I don't really take on too many speaking gigs on occasion i'll do well now that we're out of the pandemic who knows but i'll i'll do three or four if the audience is right i can be quite selective at this point in my career but if i know the audience is good i'll come in and if i can swoop in and make some money i'll do it otherwise i don't care about keynotes i you know you throw if you offer me money to go do something i can go do it it's just not my game so i like to help other people achieve that and without any training, without having your knees skinned and falling down run, and seeing it as a speaker, can you jump immediately into creating your own events? Yes. But if you lack the skills of converting an audience, it all comes down to selling, John. It's all money. If you want to go yeah. and if you're, you come from a wealthy background and you're sitting on cash and you want to make your own mistakes, go for it. You'll learn. I would suggest a prudent way is watch your money, get your experience. And if, here's the risk though. If you go on to a stage and you fail miserably without being trained properly how to sell and how to create value, and there is a science to it, a very clear science to selling. And if you go and risk to go sell, guess what? They gossip. So I know the seminar promoters around the world. And if they ask me about, can John Ball sell? And I say, yes, he can. He was on my stage. Not only did he engage the audience, people really liked him. He had a crowd. Everybody wanted to take pictures with him and had their credit cards out waving. Yes, I recommend him. And he wasn't a pain in the ass to deal with. Right. That's important. Okay? That matters a lot. There are the yeah. egomaniac speakers who are difficult to deal with. And they'll deal with me one time. After that, I'll never have them back. I don't care how much they sell because there are some outstanding salespeople from the stage. But if they have a, a, a personality that grates on me, I'll never invite them back. I don't want the stress. Yeah. I don't want the stress. And there are some of those that are incredible egomaniacs. And there are some that are unethical. I'll tell this one story, which can get you blackballed very quickly. Well, I will sidebar at this point and say there are a lot of egomaniacs in the speaking world, in keynote speaking and in professional paid speaking. However, the majority, pretty wonderful people. That has generally been my experience with the speaking world as well. So, you know, a few bad apples out there, but that's the same everywhere, right? In the next segment, Mitch does talk about someone in particular. Now, you might figure out who it is if you know stuff about this guy. I did, and I mentioned the name. However, I have blanked it out because I don't really think it's appropriate to contain that in the podcast, but it felt right in the conversation that we were having. If you don't know the name and you want to know it, contact me and I'll tell you in a private message. But probably most of you 
can figure it out. If I may, there's a well-known speaker. I don't want to, I might mention his name because I don't, you know, it's, he, he was a, he had a movie written about him. He had a movie produced about him. He had a book. He went to prison. Right. I didn't say it. You did. (laughs) He spoke on the stage for some friends of mine in Thailand, and he spoke on the stage. He was supposed to speak for four hours. Everybody came to see him. So he was the keynote speaker who also sold a sales system. He showed up, arrogant, spoke for only two hours. So people in the audience were pissed. He sold his product. They had already wire transferred to him. I think it was a hundred thousand us for him to show. This was when he was high in his career. The movie had just been released, been out of prison now because he's a felon, Mm -hmm. uh, and a deserved felon. This isn't a guy that got victimized. He, he's a, he is who he is. He then said to the, to my friends who are the biggest promoters in Thailand, you know what? I didn't make enough money here. You're going to have to wire me another $50,000 or I'm not going to deliver what I sold from the stage. You're going to have to refund all those people. Well, do you think he'll ever get invited back? Do you think I will ever put him on my stage on any level ever? Never, ever, ever. You just don't do that because you have things that go around about you. It hurts your reputation. And I never mentioned his name. It's true you didn't. I didn't. And I it don't may need, or may not be the person who I may mentioned or may before. not be. It could be Joey Goldberg. I don't know, or Joey Smith, Smith, I, I, whomever. That individual will never get invited back. Egomaniac, yeah. unethical, didn't speak the agreed about time, and then and blackmailed people, blackmailed the promoters to have more money. These are like the they were the nicest, kindest people. They brought me out of uh, retirement because then I retired again after this issue, I was living in Chiang Mai, Thailand, and they came and found me through another referral. Oh, there's this guy up in Chiang Mai, an American that's living there. You got to bring him on stage. So they brought me out of retirement back in 2016, and I've been at it now full-time since. But they were the nicest people, and they had just run this event where some other American speakers were there who did very well for them, who did not have the big name, who were ethical people that I knew very well, these people, and did their job. But when you get bent over like that and forced into compliance, and that wasn't your deal, that's awful. Just don't do that. Be honorable. Your reputation is all you have. So did you figure it out? Did you know who we were talking about? If you did, then this is going to make sense to you. And if you didn't, say, let me know. I'll tell you in a private message. But I can remember a number of years ago when this person's events were starting to be sold. And I was involved in working with the events company who were promoting these events as well. And so a bunch of my friends were, some of them were working at these events. And some of them were just wanting to go and attend and were very excited about going. I point blank refused. It's better not to be around and not be learning from these people who you know are not ethical. You know that even, yeah, okay, they may have served their time for what they've done, but they may still be unapologetic as this particular person is and not particularly changed. I just think it's a good idea if you are someone who cares about your integrity to protect it and not spend your time going into environments with people who have none. Because who you spend time with, who you learn from, is important. And I want to learn from ethical people. And I want to be an ethical person, which is why I want to learn from them. I want to be around people who walk their talk. When you do find those people who really do walk their talk, you will find that those are the environments you will want to be around as well. And if you're the kind of person who's out there wanting to be doing this kind of talking, you showing up in that way is going to create those environments too. How do you get people over their stuff with sales? You just get over it. And how do you do it? You just do it over and over again. You get good. I taught martial arts for years and people would come and I could see the fear in their face when they have to step in the arena and realize you're going to get punched. You're going to get kicked in the gut. You're going to get bruised and battered. Get in there, get punched in the face. Next time, 
you'll, you'll block, you'll move your head out of the way versus eating a jab. You're going to get better with this over time. You guys play soccer in the UK or you call it football. Okay. UK. You weren't good, John, when you first kicked the ball. I'm still not. Well, all right. Well, that's your, <laughs> yeah. all right. But you get my point. You're yeah. probably better, even though you may not have been the star on the team, you're better at kicking the ball than you were when you, the first time you kicked it. We all fell down on our bicycle and, you know, we had maybe training wheels at some point you take the training wheels off and you're able to balance and, and march and, and continue to pedal forward. That's the metaphor with selling too. go fail your way to success. Go make your mistakes, cut your teeth on failure and your teeth will be really sharp later. So you can chew down and eat that beef. Yeah. And you just, yeah. you gotta, you gotta go in the water. I, I would honestly say, yeah, I don't believe that there is any other way to success. I don't no, think you can you get to success without going through the phase. You got to, you got to risk or no reward. You can live the safety of being an MC. You can live the safety of being a trainer, which is content that's dispensed over two, three days. And it follows a workbook format. There's no enthusiasm necessarily, or it could be enthusiasm, but it's fill in the blanks and teaching this. That's not risky. Keynote, semi-risky because you may not get great evaluations. Ultimate risk and ultimate reward is the platform pitch person. Mm. You aren't paid. You better perform or you're not eating. And you got to fail. I failed in the beginning several times. I kept. And how did I handle it? I sought out coaching from the best in the business. I sought out coaching and I yeah. spent a lot of money investing. It wasn't an expense. It was an investment because I made that investment back many, many, many times over. And now I'm in the position where I teach others. Which is incredibly high value. So I don't know if this is going to be the same thing or not, but what do you find most fulfilling and or most exciting about being a platform pitch person? That table rush. The table rush is the ultimate, John. When people sign up and you see those numbers, it's the table rush. Alternatively, when I sold on live television on a channel in America called Home Shopping Network, we knew instantly whether we're selling and connecting or not because there was a, a turning. There was a, a number that kept rolling on screen. So I would see 50 sales, 60 sales, 70 or flatlining. I better change or re-energize because if I don't sell a certain amount over an hour or no, not an hour, I didn't have that long of a spot, but in let's say 10 minutes, if I didn't sell 3000 units of a widget, I'm going to get a talking to all about the numbers and selling. And it takes a while. I sucked the first time I went on live TV to sell. I threw up in the bathroom. I was so embarrassed. I, that was it. Came back, threw up less. Third time I started to do well. You got to go through that pain in order to realize the game. You know, it's, you know, there's fear and I love the metaphor or the acronym I created out of fear. Face everything and rise. I love that. Face that fear, get through the pain, go through the boot camp. At the end, you're going to be a strong soldier. Go through it. You're going, to feel, you're going to feel good about yourself. Your shoulders are going to be back. You're going to be in that starched uniform. The same holds true for platform pitching. Go through the pain. Get screamed at in your own head by your own judge, which is you. Or possibly the promoter will say, hey, what the F happened out there, Mitch? What happened? Or great job, man. I can't wait till we do this again next year. You're going to get one or the other, or you, or the scary is you don't get any feedback. It happens. You learn, you pick up your bootstraps and you continue and you learn from it. If you don't learn from it, get into another business, get out. It's not for everybody. It's the ultimate challenge. In my opinion, a live audience on the stage where you're walking around naked, they're looking at you. Oh, he's got, you know, this or that. They're looking at you. You're not wearing any clothes. They're looking at you. You are on display to this audience of hundreds, if not thousands of people. Get off the stage, get down from the stage. I don't sell on the stage. I'm in the audience. I work the room. 
Another technique, I'm shaking the hand of Bill in the front because Bill is then my conduit to shake hands with everyone else in the audience. Little techniques like this, making mm -hmm. sure, making small tweaks, connecting and getting people to buy in, you know, through the use of trial closes. Can you see yourself implementing this system to have the life of X, X being the one that I just played the testimonial, or there's somebody live in the audience, John, when you implemented this selling system, you went from zero to now $10,000 profit each time you speak. Is that good? Would you like to have the results that John had? Raise your hand. If you can see yourself doing what John did with no training, no expertise in selling from the stage, he was a keynote speaker. He made the transition. He made the change. He chose to welcome money in his life abundantly. Who likes abundant money? These are all tie down techniques. You know, everybody mm. has different ways of doing it, but I'm using you as the vehicle. You're in the audience and able to sell more or somebody I just played on video who said, oh, after attending Mitch's course, I felt this way, this way, this way. I got uh, why, why, why. And I did it over 90 days. So putting all these parameters in there, make it achievable, believable. And if they look like the guy I just played in the testimonial, they can relate to him or relate to her. Ethnicity, age, all of those things matter. For, for a listener who may be in training or mm -hmm. may be doing keynoting, what elements of those are transferable into platform pitch selling? All of them. Because if you are exposed, here are the people who make the best platform salespeople. In my opinion, I already mentioned the competitiveness. Okay. If you've played organized sports or individual sports, even better. You're competing against yourself. And you've done that. If you are a boxer, you are an individual uh, bowler, somebody who likes to keep score. And that's already ingrained in your psyche. If you are a trainer, you have the ability already. If you aren't an entertainer, if you're not an actor or a comedian, those people also have an easier way to transition in because they know how to connect with an audience emotionally, mentally, make them laugh. Laughter is a great bridge, great mm. connector. So if you are an actor or a comedian, musician, who also can feel what it's like to connect with an audience, you've got an advantage over someone who is an accountant, who's behind the scenes and doesn't have that ability Yet, it can be developed. It can be developed. Takes a while, but you then learn techniques to connect with an audience, virtually or live and in person. I think those are good skill sets. So they can do it. They've just got to study people who are doing it and have the numbers to support it. How, how practiced do you need to be to be able to get up on stage and do this? Extremely. Extremely practiced. If you think you're just going to walk up and wing it, you're going to wing yourself right out the door. Do you think a Shakespearean actor practices to deliver that to the live stage, going back to Queen Elizabethan with her neck thing? You know, all this, those people are well practiced to deliver. This is a performance, ladies and gentlemen. It is a performance. If you believe, because you know your subject matter, and you've done this before, the best speakers I know are practicing and iterating in the hallway before they take the stage. All of them. The ones that were bound to fail are, you know, playing grab ass or maybe chit chatting to their wives on the phone before they take the stage. No, it requires total focus. I meditate before I take the stage every time, 100% of the time. This is my business. I treat it as such. Without this, I don't eat. I focus 100% on the delivery. I practice, I'm rehearsed, I'm ready. Mentally, physically, I make sure that my physical is all put together. My hair is right. My shoes are shined. My nails are clean. All of these matter. All the small distinctions matter. Little hinges swing big doors. And I am in total alignment. And this wasn't an overnight process. I learned this over time. 
small refinements along the way. So yes, it's preparation, it's practice, and be the best professional you can. On average, how, how long does it take people to go from learning these skills to being good at them? It's not time, it's quantity. I would say after 25 live stage appearances of selling and then going back and measuring, looking at your footage, watching yourself, you, you must record every presentation. It doesn't matter if it's a camcorder, something simple, you park it at the back of the room on a tripod, you put your own speaker receiver system in place. If they don't give you the footage, don't rely on them or expect them. Analyze the audience, look at the audience and look at yourself when you connected and when you didn't. There's no greater judge and consultant than yourself. You can pay somebody like me or pay somebody else to look at your footage and tell you, this is what I would say here. This is where you connected well. This is where you didn't. Yeah. But you doing it yourself will yield the greatest result, in my opinion. Mish, this is, this is such a fascinating conversation. I, I, I could go on all day, but I, I have to respect your time. I know that there's going to be people listening to this, thinking there's going to be like, how do I learn from somebody like you? Like, do I have to fly myself out to Singapore? I mean, how, how can I come and learn from a master like yourself? I am going to create a, a course online. I'm going to record this upcoming event because this is a topic I have only shared with private clients that have paid me a lot of money. I don't make this public because I don't want it watered down. And it's something I've acquired over years and years and years of doing this. And it's uh, something I take seriously because it's the highest level. It's not some cracked product that you can buy on the internet for, you know, or on Udemy for 20 bucks. No, 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 no. This requires total scrutiny. And I have a, an event coming up in late October and then another early November in Singapore to a group of my high level clients who are serious about going to the next level. Most of them don't have the speaking experience. So I'm then taking them through the process of creating their own events and augmenting that through getting on other people's stages, which I also present, which is important. So I, I will have an online course. And in some cases, if someone is interested, I can coach them virtually. Awesome. What's going to be the best way for people to connect with you so they can stay updated on what's on offer? They can go to getinterviewedguaranteed.com forward slash meet with Mitch, and we can chat, see if I'm the right fit. Real simple. You can awesome. put it in your show notes, a get interview guaranteed, or then you, I can share with you when my next live event is. Fantastic. Mitch, I've really thoroughly enjoyed this conversation today. I hope you could tell I've been completely wrapped in everything that you've been saying. Well, you've so lived fascinating. In the, you've lived in it. You know what yeah. I'm saying. You've been in yeah. this environment. You've been immersed in it for, what, 20 years. So yeah. you understand. I've lived it the, my, my adult life. This has been my life. I'm not young anymore. I've been doing this a long, long time. And, that's, and I appreciate and I feel privileged to be on your show today, John. I wanted to tell you that. I, I just think she shares so much value and I know there's a lot more there as well. So we may, we may have to discuss bringing you back again in the future to do, discuss a few more things, Mitch, but seriously, this has been an incredibly interesting episode and I don't think anybody could listen to this and not come away, at least be curious about wanting to know more about how to do selling from the stage. Thank you for being my guest and sharing all this wonderful knowledge on Present Influence. Great, John. Thank you. So here are my final thoughts to be a bit Jerry Springer about it all. For me, this was a fun and fascinating interview. And the world of selling from stage is a little different to the keynote world that I'm more used to, but I have been around enough of the selling from stage world to have some sense of what it's like. I've even been trained to some degree in some of the methodology of selling from stage, just not particularly experienced on it. But I do think that if this is something that is enticing to you, like, I've had those clients who've come to me and said that, that on their first coaching session, they've said, point me to the money as a speaker. Where's the money? If I get that, and I've always kind of said, ah, oh, that's not the right attitude to have. Well, look, if I ever get that question again, this is what I'm going to say. If you want the big money in speaking, you're also going to be going into the most competitive arena, which is 
platform sales. If that's what you want to do, master your speaking skills and master the art of selling from the platform. And I can think of a few people better to learn it from than Mitch. I know that T. Harvecki, who I've worked with for years, is an expert at selling from the stage. One of the things that Mitch said earlier in our conversation was that he learned from the masters. And you have to do that to the degree where you can actually then become one of the masters and then you become someone to learn from. So I do think Mitch is a great person for you to learn this from. He may not be for everybody. You know, we all have our different tastes of who we like and who we don't. If you are one of those people who has a product or a service, maybe an online course or maybe an, an in-person course or program, and you want to be able to sell that whilst you're at a speaking event, or you, may, you, know, you maybe have that arrangement with the people you've set up your speaking event with, or you get invited somewhere to speak and maybe doing something for free. And part of the arrangement is that you can sell a product or service. Great. You want to be able to do that in a way that isn't going to be cheesy, that isn't going to turn everyone off from you and from everything that you may have said that's of value. Learning how to do that really effectively is going to be incredibly powerful for you. So if this is a skill that you don't yet have in your speaker arsenal and would like to have, then I suggest reaching out to Mitch or... Or if you feel that maybe Mitch isn't for you, find someone else who is an absolute ace at this. Those people are out there and selling from the stage is undoubtedly an incredible skill to have. Now, my next episode is going to be a continuation of my keynote creation process where I'm taking you through the process that I'm going through that I've been coaching people on for a long time now on how to create a keynote talk. That's going to be my new keynote presentation. If creating a signature keynote presentation is interesting to you, you may want to go back and check out the first few episodes. They're not super long. The next episode, we're going to be getting much more into the talk creation element of it, where I'm going to be taking you through my process of creating the outline of the talk and starting to put stories and metaphors and things like that in there. And also one of the tools that I use to help me create talks that you may not want to miss. So I hope you'll join me for that. If you're not already following the show, please make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you're on. If it's YouTube, it's nice and easy to do, hit subscribe. If it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts, all you have to do is hit the plus button or the follow button and you'll get notified for all future episodes. Do have some incredible interviews coming in the future as well. I'll tell you more about those next time. But wherever you're going right now, whatever you're doing, have an amazing rest of your day and week. See you next time.